Time Virtually, we're not that far apart. I mean, I feel like... Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. <laughs> G'day, everyone. Pete Techman Coman here for another exciting episode of The Tech Effect. And the show wouldn't be complete without the one, the only, the bearded tech... Mr. Mark, the bit of tech ski and welcome, yes. Mark. Oh, Pete, thank you so much. I really do like your intros. This is like a <laughs> this is like a marriage we've got going on here. It's like when two become one or something like that. Um, it's anyway. just a shame we're so far apart. Yeah. Well, like, so, I mean, virtually not. we're not that far apart. I mean, I feel like yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. <laughs> Doing everything in reverse is uh, is yeah. painful. How are you, mate? I'm well yourself. Yeah, I'm very, very well actually. I've been, uh, I've had a bit of time off recently. I've done a bit of full drive, driving up the north coast of Australia and had a, had a good, good bit of uh, good past six or eight weeks actually. What? What? Hang on. I, I, I hear that you had uh, on the trip. You, uh, you didn't get too far without a bit of a mishap. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was a quick, quick little story. I left, I left home. I'm going four o'clock. I was aiming for uh, for Charters Town. So it's about. 13 to 14 hours drive, right? <laughs> I, on the day, I'm, I'll leave home at four o'clock in the morning um, and yeah, we'll punch out a good day. I'll get in there early, we'll set up camp, have a couple of beers and, and life will be pretty good. Righto, we're good. I get two hours, an hour, hour and a half and I've got a couple of dash lights come on. I'm going, oh no, I know what this is. I'll just get to the next town, just get to the next town. And, uh, and then I'll pull up because it'll be 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning and I'll be able to get some help. Anyway, I, I didn't make it to town. <laughs> all the lights come on. I lost all my power. No. Everything's gone. I've got, I know exactly what this is. I've seen this happen on a mate's car recently. Uh, I've done an alternator. So um, this is great. So I've got two fridges in the back. Um, you know, I've got more 12 volt power than you can poke a stick at. Probably why my alternator died. Uh, <laughs> and I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere uh, calling a tow truck. And I'm going, this is a great start. So. Uh, eight hours at the mechanics and they had me on the road again and I drove till midnight to get to where I was supposed to be at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> well, I was going to say it was your brother's birthday, right? I mean, you were, you were heading up there for for yeah, celebrations. Was, Did you make it on time? I was trying to get to Cairns. Yeah, well, that, luckily was, I, I hooked in that night and then uh, then we were pretty easy running the Cairns the next day. So it was all, all good. But um, I'm glad, actually, I'm very glad that I got rid of uh, the problems very early whilst I could get help and not way up at the top of... Uh, Australia, where I'm a thousand kilometres from Cairns, and <laughs> you know, it costs you three thousand dollars to get a, co a, a tow truck. So, yeah, exactly. pretty. Uh, pr look, you know, pretty eventful. It was good. Had had a good time. Bit refreshed now, so life's pretty Very good. good. The yeah. bat, we're back. We're back on on air, and we have we have a special guest. We, I mean, you know, I mean, every yeah. every show we 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 want to step it up each time. You know, with our special guests. So, well, the, who have we the, got today? It's interesting. We, the, the, I think. Uh, you know, in one of our previous shows, we had uh, a friend of uh, a friend of the show, a friend of this guest as well, and um, he might have thrown a challenge out there. I think he said, "Oh, we, we might have one up to you or something like that." So we we really just had it was a logical progression. Uh, and I want to introduce Frank Alimo, uh, senior audio visual system specialist at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Let's shorten that to UNLV. Frank, <laughs> mate, thanks for coming on the show. How are you? <laughs> thanks for having me, guys. I'm pretty, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. That's awesome, mate. Um, so, Frank, we've got lots to talk to you about, uh, and uh, no doubt we'll have a few laughs along the way. What I want to do is, uh, let's, why don't we just start with uh, a little bit about you, uh, your history, where you've come from, how you got into AV, and how you ended up where you are right now in that seat. Yeah, I started uh, pretty much like most of us did in this industry. I mean, I started pushing a cart uh, as a, like a student worker, so to speak. Um, I used to be a DJ in high school and a friend of mine, his father was the MIS manager at a, at a small private university. And I was always hanging around their house and he goes, hey, I'm sick of seeing you standing around and not getting paid. He goes, there's a job opening up my university, apply for it, we'll get you the job. And that's what happened. So I started pushing an AV cart and that was when I was, you know, 20 years old. 
Um, did that at that small school, a uh, school called Marywood University in Scranton, PA. Um, <clears throat> and I, I worked there for about 12 years. And then uh, I left and I went into uh, the casino business. And I, I was working for Pennsylvania's first, um, first legal casino. And I worked at Mohegan Sun for about four years there. And then I left that and came here to Vegas, um, back in a university surrounded by casinos. So I'm like, Vegas is like where I started in higher ed is where I'm at now in higher ed, but I'm surrounded by casinos is where I used to work back. in. So I have like a little bit of experience of everything from, you know, higher ed to entertainment to live shows. And, and now I'm doing this and I'm in the right town for it. Right. So, yeah, um, so, and, and here, uh, I'm, I got hired as a, a system designer slash project manager. So essentially my, my role has grown exponentially over the last you know, 10 years that I've been here, it's I take on a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And our department grows a little bit more and you become a victim of your own success. And eventually like you start taking on, like we just made a joke today, our, our title here is classroom technology services, but I, I think we're going to try and change it to campus technology services because we do more than classrooms. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm a project manager, AV designer here at, at UNLV. Um, I'm, I'm the acting manager right now for the department. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, yeah, I'm like the uh, audiovisual jack of all trades, master of nothing here. <laughs> oh, you mentioned Scranton, Pennsylvania before. Mm -hmm. I mean, the question that everyone would obviously want to know is where did you buy your paper from? That's right. So I actually uh, Dunner Mifflin right there yeah. uh, based on pen paper, which is like right down the street from where our school was. I actually got to meet a lot of cast. I did a lot of. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, I, got, I did a lot of, uh, from the, they did their openings at, at, at different event places and whatnot. So every now and then I'd sneak in and help hang a, a light fixture here and there. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting some of the cast. I met just about everybody but, my, but Steve Carell. He's the only guy I didn't meet. Wow. Well, it's, it's one of my favorite shows. And, uh, and now, like living in New York, it's relatively close. And it's, it's on my bucket list of places to visit. Scranton, Pennsylvania, home of Dunder Mifflin. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the office uh, TV show, huge success. But Frank, um, look, obviously, so you, you've, you've been in AV all, all your life. Um, you and I met in 2016 16, at yeah. Infocom. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, I, Infocom were doing these tours of various facilities. You know, there was uh, um, obviously some of the casinos and so on and, and uh, you and your team there put your hand up to say, hey, yeah, look, why don't we bring a, a, a bus full of people? There was probably 30, 40 people, I would say, on, on the tour to, to take everyone through all the rooms and the new spaces that you've done. And like, that's, that's, where we've, that's where we met. Yeah, I mean, we got here in 20, well, I got here in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did a tour. Um, that year we did a tour in 14 we did one in 16 okay. we did one in 18 we've done a tour just about every year um, yep. that i've been here um and each year it's funny because infocom comes back they're like oh how are you going to top this tour how are you going to top this yeah. tour because we've gotten lucky and every other off year we had some really new, good projects i think you were at the library tour i think it yes. was the one that we did with you is it all of our library rooms that we did we upgraded mm -hmm. classrooms and we have a nice event space and then we followed up with one at our hospitality building the next year, which the building is phenomenal. I mean, um, we're really proud of what, what, what that building kind of turned out as. And, and this year's, um, I actually did a virtual one. So we shot all the footage and I gave the talk afterwards yeah. of our Atmos theater, which really sucked because it's an Atmos theater, right? You don't want to yeah, do that I, virtually. You got to get in there. You got to feel that room. And I mean, it's, it is insane. I mean, it is a, it is an awesome room. I mean, it is, it is it's it's probably the sweetest room that we have on campus and and next year for 2022 um when we're back here in vegas um they haven't reached out yet they usually reach out to me right after infocom wraps up in orlando yeah. um but yeah we we have a, a couple things up our sleeve for for next year here in town yeah, awesome. one thing that i was impressed with there is that like obviously you're a uh a crestron university i mm -hmm. believe you probably still crestron university and you guys were upgrading this. <laughs> oh, okay. got, all, got all the merch there. <laughs> and um, the, the one, th I mean, there was many things that impressed me about the what you guys have done there. I mean, a, a couple of things. Uh, you guys, I believe you do all your design in-house and your implementation all in-house, right? What, what, 
uh, why is that? Why do you do that? Why why don't you go out to market for designers and contractors and programmers and things? What what's the reason for keeping it in house? I'm a control freak. Um, yeah. We 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 find it easier to. It, from a support standpoint, it's easier if you know what the trouble you went through to get it installed was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have a great team here. I, I got five myself and, and four other guys. We have, we, we have everything from soup to nuts here. Um, we have uh, two programmers on staff. Uh, there's another designer like myself. And then we have a, a computer spe software specialist who also does our digital signage. He's a, our physics administrator and whatnot. But we all throw our hand, hats in the ring. We all do the same thing. We're all, you know, if somebody can't get over to that job, someone runs over and handles it. I mean, that's how we are here. We're small and we're a small team. Mm -hmm. But we've noticed when we started developing our standards a few years ago, it took us about two years to develop the standards and to move everything forward. And then it got to the point where our standard became a menu. And mm -hmm. so we almost have flavors now. So yeah. we have the same standard of equipment, but this room is a little bigger than this room. And this room has dual projection versus single projection. This one has monitors, but the backbone is the same. The standards are still mm -hmm. there and we can control that. So why go out and, and pay someone to come in and do a design when we can do it ourselves? So yeah. there are projects that we do bring consultants in. We have a great relationship with some consultants here in town. Um, the hospitality building, for instance, um, we had consultants involved and, and there's some reasons for that. And, you know, if it's a state funded project, they, they pretty much require a consultant be on board and to handle all the drawings. So the drawings go to get stamped and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. and, and that's great because the consultants that we work with know how well versed we are. So it makes that process a lot easier that we sit down and go to a sheet of paper, do a page turn and it's we flying through it, write letters and this is done, this is done, this is done. And we go to the next page and it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, from a, from a install standpoint, we, we, we can do some installs. We do some small ones here ourselves, but, but we've contracted with a, our preferred integrator to do our installs for us. It's a lot easier because there's only four of us here, five of us. So it's easier to, you know, we just come manage the project, let them do the installation. And then we come behind it and either program it or test it out and then commission it and whatnot. So that's kind of like how we have our, our setup going, our flow chart. Yeah, and, and with so, the you mentioned the, the programming, you I remember distinctly. Uh, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, who, the programmer that you had on board, but he got up there and spoke to everyone and explained that you actually he actually does A B tests, so he'll mm -hmm. actually roll out two flavors of a touch panel to see which ones he gets the least amount of calls from. Yep. And are you guys still yeah. doing that or? So that's, uh, that's Michael Thiel. That's our programmer. He's, he is a, an AV assassin over there because I call him an assassin because I'll come at him with a sheet of paper and I'll say, how's this design? He tears it to pieces because <laughs> he's like, we could use this and we could do this and we could do that. So that's the bonus of having a designer and a programmer on staff together. You go to a consultant that's doing that or an integrator, that guy might not be in the same office as him, as another person. They might have to wait a couple of days. We could do it all right here in the office and we get our yeah. design down. We get our program down and he already has a head start on programming the room before it even gets installed now. So that's good. Yeah. So, but to answer your question about the, the program, yeah, we, we kind of, he has versions now is what we're calling them because mm -hmm. we've had so many uh, iterations over the years um, that we've, we've found a panel that worked well for so many years. And then eventually it was like, eh, I got a little stale. Let's change this. And we go to this. Yeah. So right now, um, he essentially has one panel, one, one uh, flavor for them all, so to speak, and then um, loads up the panel in the program and can make any change on the fly he can if we need to eliminate or add anything to a room. So basically, it's like all of our stuff in one program, and you just take the stuff you need and push it, and then we're good nice. to go. So, so what, are the, what are the nuggets you've sort of learned by, by doing this? Like, you, Well, as you say, you're not so much A-B split testing anymore, really. You've sort of got a base thing. But what's, what are the gold nuggets? What, is, what, are you, what are your takeaways? And why did you really do the A-B split testing, really? And how did it, sort of, how did it end up playing out? It's, it's interesting because we have instructors that will use the same touch panel for like five years. And then we make a change and they don't even notice it. And then we have the instructor, we make a change and they're freaking out and they're like, I want my old panel back. And we're like, but it's the same thing right here. It just has a different name. So there's a little bit of uh, intrepidation. Like sometimes they just get like washed over and they get upset and they get scared because it's not what they're used to. And look at, I mean, instructors, they're geniuses in their field. I mean, they come in to do that and that's, they're there to, to speak and 
and, and present for their specialty. If you knock something out of whack, it can knock their whole day out of whack. If you change that touch panel without telling them, or if you change the, the way the screens are laid out. So generally we don't try to do that anymore. We caught a lot, little bit of flack for that, but it was beneficial for us um, because when we were able to, like you said, find out what they liked and didn't like, that helped us develop it further and, and to move our program, you know, to make it much easier. And, and now it's, it's really, really intuitive now to the point where, you know, it's like Joe was saying on his, he hates page flips. Like Joe can't stand page flips. Yeah. And he came to campus and he saw we had page flips still. And I was like, well, we don't have total page flips. We have, you know, a few page flips and we just don't have, you know, the easy stuff that he has because our rooms are on steroids. Our rooms are not like Joe's. Joe's rooms, yeah. he simplified. He went to three rack units and has a minimal amount of equipment. We've spoiled our instructors so much in the years. We can't take that away now. So, yeah. you know, we have a local PC. We have aux inputs. We have the BYOD stuff. We have a switcher. We have a bi -amp processor. We have microphones. I mean, a microphone drawer. I mean, we're insane with our lecterns. And trust me. The integrators know that we're insane because they want to kill us because we're using every ounce of that 12 RU that's in there and the lecterns are packed, but yeah. they still work well and, and they keep the instructors happy and when the instructors are happy, they're off our back and then that way it's everybody's happier. So that's where Joe, Joe's spaces and our spaces are a little different. Um, he's got that private money. I got that state money. So. <laughs> Uh, nice one. So you've worked on some uh, some killer projects. I've, I was uh, look if if you after the show, if you look at your LinkedIn, you'll see that I've been stalking you, uh, <laughs> doing a little bit of homework, um, looking at some of the some of the projects you've worked on, like the the, the planar fitness wall. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a beautiful photo, if nothing else. Um, and, but but recently you've you've got the uh, the theatre, and there's another one you've just recently worked on we'll we'll get into that in a second but the the, the theater project that uh sounded pretty interesting tell us about that yeah that that was that was i'd say the the most painful project i've ever done here on campus but it was worth every ounce of the of the the labor pains um we took a a, a room that was built in 1957 and has never been renovated and we had to gut it down to the asbestos strip it down to the spare the bare concrete uh, on the floor, the walls, the ceiling, gut, and rebuild it in six months. And we did that. Basically, it was 108 business days is what we figured out. And that was from the day that they came to remove the seating to the day that I was able to turn it on and bring a, a tour in. It was 108 business days. Now, we're really proud of that. And we had a great team um, between our construction team here on campus, our, our plan construction folks that run our projects, um, and then the architect, um, the consultants that we had for, for electrical, for HVAC, for lighting, all of that. Every, everybody was involved with this. It was, it was really, really a good experience that we had a lot of people that wanted to see this succeed. And I think it, it helped because our president's office is in the seventh floor of that building. So when you tell that to some people and they know that somebody might pop in and see the, see this room there, you know, that they're going to want to make it special. Right. So yeah, we, we, um, we put a 28,000 lumen Barco projector in there. We have the world's largest Stuart film screen director's choice with four way masking. Just, so just, just on that, I, I, um, I looked at, looked at the dimensions, uh, the, the largest Stuart, and that was 26 <laughs> foot. Five, yeah, fourteen and a half foot. That, that yeah, right? 300, 328 diagonal. I think it is. Yeah, wow. wow. For, for those in with, Australia, uh, that's eight meters wide. <laughs> that's a big screen. Eight and, and it's and a uh, it's high. it's perforated. Uh, it's it's the cinema perf line, uh, and it's got the four way uh, motors that mask. So left side, right side, top and bottom, the whole length of the screen, the motors that move it from you know four by three, sixty nine, two two by one, thirty five by whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's it's massive and it's, it's so, um, it was so difficult to install because we had to build the screen housing and the screen on site and it shipped in two giant crates that we had a forklift off a truck and then 12 guys had to carry it into the building and then we had to tear it apart and then build it inside and hoist it to the ceiling. It was nuts. I mean, it was just, and it was all done by our AV integrators, CCS, um, CCS Las Vegas is, are the guys that did it. And they, um, 
they spent literally day and night for weeks to get that room to where it's at right now. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, so I'm guessing you've got a, a bio box at the back of the room or something like that, where you've got some equipment and operators. Would that be correct? No, actually we have oh. a, it's a standalone rack. So okay. we have, um, so it's your typical rear projection room, uh, front, but rear, um, yeah. front viewing. So we have the, the projectors back on a giant pedestal back there at eight feet off the ground, shooting through the glass, um, 28,000 lumen, uh, Barco cinema projector which has its own chiller with uh, its own HVAC chiller that runs down through it. So there's no chimney stack required for that room, which was great because it's completely sealed up. And then we have the rack right next to it that has the Dolby Atmos processor, um, the microphones that we house in there because we have like 12 mics in there. Um, All the receivers are in there. Uh, 29 or 30,000 watts of crown power. So we got a stack of crown amps in there. Yeah. Um, and, And that that's it. The lectern on the on the stage, uh, we're sending our sources back via NVX through the through the network back to that back room. So the front where the where the instructor is, they just have their local PC, their auxiliary inputs, their Blu-ray players, etc., dot cam and touch panel all routes back to the projector area, which um, does all of our source switching, does our audio. And it also has the alchemy player that is built into the projector where we can run first run movies. So we, they can ship us a, a CRM and then we can download it to there and it goes right into the wow. touch panel layout. So I could choose, you know, if it's a Superman movie and we've loaded it on there in the back, the instructor doesn't have to go to the back. All yeah. he does is go to the touch panel, slide over to the alchemy player, hit play, and there it is. So the lectern does that. We keep the instructors out of the back room. They don't need to be back there. <laughs> and, you know, that's it. It's a, 56 or 58 speakers are in the room, um, 10 over your head, 15 behind the screen, eight on the back wall, 10 on the side walls. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. That's what, all right. what speakers it's, did you end up running with, Frank? It's the JBL Cinema line. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So we, we use that with the, uh, the dual 18 subs uh, cabinets. So there's four of those down behind the screen. Uh, we're flying two in the back. And then there's your left and right and center, left, right, center, left, right, left, center and center. So the five, which have the uh, your cabinet with your highs and your mids stacked across the center of the screen. Uh, so that, that's all uh, behind the screen that you can't see. And then everything else in the in the classroom itself is 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 all on the walls and in the ceiling. So, so you finished it, I believe, uh, January 2020. Yeah. How? How many times has it, has it been used? Yeah, so <laughs> now it's 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 Loaded it's getting used a little bit. That one. Right, a little bit. <laughs> so COVID hit. They got four weeks out of it, and they were thrilled. And then COVID hit, and everybody goes home. And we were hooking up an Xbox in there. To be honest with you, we had <laughs> we had nothing to do. There's nobody on campus, and we're like, let's go play some Forza. So we're in there playing with the Xbox on that thing, <laughs> wow. right? So um, summer came around, and, and our 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 president and our provost. They were like, well, we're going to bring some classes back and and we're going to see what kind of place we could do it. But we have to bring them back to the biggest rooms possible to get social distancing. So I have a, you know, a 265 seat auditorium with 12 people in it. And I'm like, man, our math equations on that screen, really what we should be seeing right now. So unfortunately, um, that was the case for, you know, the summer of 20 and then. Uh, spring of 21 came and it was minimal. And then this summer it picked up a little bit more. And right now it's packed morning till night. What, what did you use for it? Yeah, yeah. And what was the original purpose of the room? So like, what was it designed mm-hmm. for? I mean, obviously not, not Xbox, but uh, yeah, it, it's very it's specific a room. Mario Kart. But, <laughs> and so is it as, Sorry, I'm, I'm hogging all the space here, Pete. It really happens, just, just so you know, Frank. I'm normally sitting in the background and Pete's just like firing questions. But yeah, I'm, I'm a, bit of a bit of a passion point. I work in education, so I'm, I'm definitely uh, interested in, in how this sort of deploys. And uh, the, the Google, ass- sorry, the Google Assistant. We actually just installed the 3D IR emitter. So now um, we bought 50 active glasses and they're now showing 3D in, in this space and the instructors are, are loving it. So we're actually using it now. It's, I'm kind of glad we had a lull 
because it let us get a lot of the bugs out because we were chasing yeah. a couple issues here and there. Mm-hmm. So we can go in there and turn it to 11 and back it off and do what we needed yeah. to do. And it, it gave us time to have two um, service calls that they come every six months and go through the filters and go through all the temperatures, uh, ch- temperature checks of everything and, and make sure everything is working the way it should be. So, you know, touch wood, we really haven't had any, any serious issues in there. Um, one of the but, things I was going to ask you is what's the heat like around that projector? I mean, you've, and and noise levels i mean you've got the hvac in there yeah. I guess, but, but the noise levels as well you've got to manage too yeah yeah so it's a it's got a, a one foot thick cinder block wall between that room and the auditorium itself right. um the hvac for the room there's five air handlers on the above that projection room and they handle it for that room and the two rooms on the sides we did our best to mitigate the sound from there and we just got to the level of where it passed the atmos certification that we had no ambient noise coming into the room from the hvac which was a bonus because that was the biggest thing we were going for was that atmos stamp um we can hear that more than we can hear the projector in the room the projector believe it or not is not that loud um it's got a little bit of a, of a fan noise, but it's really not that loud. And considering behind a concrete wall, it's okay. We get more noise from the things that we hear in the ceiling um, and from the HVAC than we do from that projection room. And, yeah, yeah. and what was the original purpose of the room? So like, what was it designed mm-hmm. for? I mean, obviously not, not Xbox, but uh, yeah, it's a very it's specific a room. Mario Kart. But... <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so Warren Cobb, uh, he, he's, he's the genius that came to me and said, Hey, I want to do this. And I was like, what in that room? Are you kidding yeah. me? I said, how much money do you got? And he says, I got a blank check. I was like, Oh, let's do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he told me what his plan was and his plan right now, we're actually working on phase two of it. Um, he's in the planning, uh, funding seeking stages. Essentially what they want to do is they want to mix a Dolby Atmos movie in that space because wow. Let's be honest. You could you could sit in a small studio and you can mix Amos all you want, but to hear it in the room, you're going to play it in. That helps tremendously because you have the ability to turn off the speakers in different zones, and you can say, "I want the gunfire to come from here, and I want the cab door to slam over here, and a person screaming over there." When you're in that small room, you don't have the control of 56 speakers. You only have the control of the eight or ten that are around you. Yeah. So it's still zoned. So his goal was to be able to not only use it as an Atmos theater for for film presentations and, and for um, uh, film festivals and stuff like that. Um, it, it was more for mixing live in the room. So what we did is as part of our phase is we found the reference listening position in the, in the center of the room and we cut trenches back to our control room. So we're already piped out ready. So when he comes with his 68 channel soundboard and puts it right yeah. there on a, on a pedestal, we'll connect back to our processor and our server that's going to live back in that rack and make it live mix in the room. So the goal was to, to make it essentially a live mix room, but phase one was to build the room and pass the yeah. Atmos certification. So now what does faculty have to do is they have to actually go through and get trained on how to teach Atmos. So they're working on that, on that, on that portion of it. So phase one was get the room built and we got that t- taken care of. And now phase two is on him to figure out how he's going to utilize it. Yeah, nice. Nice one. Um, so on, on to the, uh, onto the next one, you've got another, uh, probably more of a hot topic that you've had a thousand interviews on, uh, recently. Yeah. Um, and that's your, your rebel flex mm-hmm. hybrid classroom. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I've been calling it a Swiss army knife of classrooms. <laughs> um, we, we were, we were, you know, we, they hit us so fast. Like it went from like, well, you guys have been sitting home for you know a year and now you're like, what are we going to do? I'm like, what are you asking me for? You, you should be coming to me and telling me this is what you want in the room. I can't tell you how to teach in the room. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so it, you know, I reached out to Joe and, and a lot of our other colleagues at other schools and tried to figure out what they were doing and what was working for them. What wasn't working for them. A lot of these schools had this deployed for years. Um, we had one room. It, hey, think back. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this was, this isn't new. This is called distance learning, right? I mean, it's essentially what it was um, minus the recording feature. So I just thought back in my head and I said, well, let's just throw everything at it and let's see what works. So we got with Michael, our programmer and and, and Matt, our other programmer. And we, we all sat down and we're like, let's, let's see what we absolutely want to do in the room. What we see what we, what we need to do in the room. And our need was, we need to have web conference, excuse me, web conferencing, and we need to have lecture capture. Lecture already exists in the room because that's, we wouldn't have a lecture, lectern without it. So mm-hmm. essentially you can do synchronous, asynchronous, and 
live lecture at any flavor you want. So the room is traditionally a lecture hall, lecture room, whatever you want to call it. The instructor can come in, sits down with the 30, instruct 30 students in the room, turn the room on, use it like a traditional lecture hall. The following instructor can come in and say, I just want to capture my, my content and myself. So that's fine. We have Panopto server here. We're a Panopto user. So they can come in, go to the touch panel, hit record now. Or if they're already scheduled for that time slot, it starts for them. So take your pick, whatever you want. So they can record their lecture. They can use content like this or talking head, stage on a stage, however you want to you want to do it. And then the third feature is add the web conferencing in. So we got our students are at home. Our instructor is on campus. Ten students or 12 students are on campus. And there's your live. And you can record it at the same time. So I was looking for like, it's not a hybrid classroom. It's not a high flex classroom because those were you know, technically high flex was, was coined by another university. I'm not quite sure which one it was, but they used the word high flex and then everybody else picked up on it. Well, mm -hmm. people aren't using it to the way they're using it. It's not a true high flex room. So I'm like, how are we going to come up with a name for this? And they were calling it this and that. And I was like, it's called rebel flex. So we just came up with the name rebel flex. And it's just basically like I do with everything else here is we just take somebody else's idea and we just make it our own. Mm -hmm. So we just we put the features in there that we know our instructors need. And and traditionally, we're um, we're a commuter school. I mean, we have, you know, 30,000 uh, students on campus. I think our undergrad is around 25 and change, 28 and change on any given year. And, you know, I would say more than 70 percent of them drive to campus. I mean, they, they've either, if they moved here from another state, they stay off campus. We don't have a lot of dorms on campus. I think we only have a couple thousand dorms on campus. So we're a non-traditional school from the sense of, uh, I think our average freshman age is 26 years old. I believe we have a very high uh, non-traditional um, student body. So you have the learners that are coming in at one area and the learners that are another area when it comes to technology. So we did the same thing with, with our rooms as we just made sure we got this as it does all the way up through that. So that's, that's our rebel flex rooms. And it has, like I said, it has your straight lecture capabilities. It has your web conferencing. It has your lecture capture. Uh, we have microphones in the ceiling. We have Panopto recording. Um, it, it's, it's got everything that, that you can possibly hope for in a lectern, wow. but uh, not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for gotcha. sure. And, and um, what do you, what, yeah, so we use the Sennheiser TCC2. Um, so we, we really, really like them because it has such a, a, a wide array, uh, a mm -hmm. spread that you can cover. And it also has the cockpit built in that allows you to um, deal with any sort of ambient noise from HVAC or anything else they have. You can knock out your zones and in 360. If you have something right beneath it, you can shut that area off and you can even focus it on the instructor area yeah. that that person has the hammer. If somebody is talking in the back room and the instructor speaks, it basically mutes that side and goes right after the noise from the instructor. So it's really, really smart. Uh, it's, I, I was joking with um, our, our Sennheiser reps. I was like, it's only, it's, it's smart, but it's only as smart as the guys that are programming it. Yeah. So, and Mike, as I said earlier, he likes to break things. So I think he's been on the phone with their engineers like a dozen times in the last two months, just trying to, well, I want to do this. I want to do this. The next thing you know, we get an email. Hey, there's a firmware update. <laughs> oh, geez. I, I wonder why. So, so yeah, it's, so it's, um, it's, it's a really, really slick room. We're really happy with it. I'm super keen to dig in this a bit more. What, what, uh, what's your, your VC platform, your soft, you're using a soft codec, no doubt. Yeah, we're a WebEx house. So WebEx and, um, they can use WebEx and Google Meetup as what the university supports. Um, we're on Zoom right now. There's many other uh, folks that are just happier with Zoom. They just use Zoom. They can, they're welcome to use whatever they want because it's, it's open source. It's just a local PC that's in the room. So whatever they want to use, they can use. It's just that the university only has a WebEx contract and we only have a Panopto contract. So if you want to record it, it's got to go to Panopto. If you want to use WebEx and get support from us, if you want to call and say nothing's working, you have to use WebEx and, and our Rebel Flex classrooms, we are forcing them all to, to uh, WebEx. Um, and we have a student, so we call them a Rebel Flex classroom assistant. So there's a student with a laptop and a headset in every class that has a Rebel Flex class. And they sit there and monitor the class for the instructor because they have, they focus on their teaching and the student, they can take care of someone raising their hand at home. 
they can moderate the class from there and do any of the switching that they need to do. So we, we provided them with a, a Revoflex assistant. Yeah. Nice one. Nice one. And, and then, so with, with your scheduling, you, you mentioned that you can have it so it can auto schedule. So the, the mm -hmm. auto record upon lesson times, are you just running that through Panopto? Yeah. So it goes through Panopto and then it, it talks back to our Crestron touch panel. So on the panel itself, um, there's a record now button for ad hoc people. So if folks are say, oh, you know what? I forgot about this. They can walk into an open classroom, hit that record button, and they fill out a form, contacts our e-learning people, and they migrate it from, you know, because when they record, it just goes to nowhere. They take it from there and they migrate it to where the web campus or wherever they're going to move it to. Yeah. So that's, that's the way it's used for that. And then if you want it to start and stop at a certain time, um, if it's scheduled, you'll see on that tab, it'll say a scheduled uh, no, no recording schedule or so it'll have the listing there. So, you know, if you start at 11 o'clock, we're going to start that at like 1058 and it's going to, if you go to 1115 or 1145, we're going to go to 1150. So yeah. it, 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 you might see some people coming in and out of the class before in each other, but we're going to get your content. Yeah. Right. And then it, and Panopto, you're just using Panopto to do all the indexing of mm -hmm. um, all the, the content and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. And, should, and so you can, then it's a, uh, it's a repository so you can get in there and pull it out at a later date from a student mm -hmm. level yep yeah yeah it's i believe they store it for a year um and then after that year we ask the instructor if they want to migrate it or off-site or if they if they take it down i'm not 100 percent sure on that one all oh, right okay Understood. Understood. it takes up a lot of space so i mean I, I i know the first year that we used it our number was like here and then the second semester we used it the number went up like that and then COVID hit and it went through the roof and we actually maxed our time and had to buy the unlimited license so now we are an, we have an unlimited amount of of room which unlimited doesn't mean unlimited we've we've realized so <laughs> the fair use policies apply in there I'm, yeah I'm, but so so what are the what are the results been like with the what's the tape up, take up been like and what are the results been like so we're four weeks in this this is uh starting a week four right now um and we have 23 instructors are using it um, so that's good. We we finished about 30 rooms. Um, there's 23 that are in this, what we're calling a pilot program. And with the pilot program, it allowed them access to our faculty center, which gives them the ability to help change their pedagogy and their syllabus and anything that they normally had to teach in a lecture hall. You got to adapt that quickly now to, to this virtual world, right? And, and a lot of these instructors are just not familiar with it. So the great part about the program is our faculty center, which we just finished renovating that not too long ago, they help provide that, that bridge for the instructors. They provide videos for them and they teach people on how they're can do this and, and easily, I should say, um, give them a lot of resources and they work with our online ed folks. So, that, cause they've been doing it for a while. So now it's two different resources that the instructors have to use. And we gave them a stipend. So the university paid them $500 to basically be guinea pigs. And so we're four weeks in and we haven't gotten too many complaints. We've gotten a few and, and they're aware of some of the growing pains we were going to have here and there. I think a lot of it is more just not user. I don't like to call it user error. It's more like user understanding because sometimes they don't understand what the room can and can't do. Uh, they, they, blame, they like to blame the technology and the technology has limitations because we have to tell it what to do. So they might think it can do one thing because they might have did this for a couple months while they were at home because everybody went home and they did whatever the hell they could just to, to teach. This is now on the campus and this is the way we have to institute it so we can support it on a global level. So we finished 20, uh, 30 rooms. We have about 26 left to do. Um, and we're going to slowly implement them that uh, between now and spring. Um, but we've gotten good feedback. We've had quite a few instructors who aren't even in the program that, showed up on campus and wanted to teach like this and were not aware of the program. So we just direct them to the registrar's office and the registrar was like, yeah, we could put you in one of those rooms. Unfortunately, we're not going to have a rebel assistant for you. We're not going to be able to give you this, that, and the other thing because you missed the deadline to be in the pilot. But us, my department and, and e-learning, we will send people there to train you, teach you, get you ready to go up to speed. And then the next thing you know, they're three days in and they're like, yeah, I don't need an assistant anymore. I'm all good. And they just sit there and they work it all themselves. Mm -hmm. So we're getting good feedback. Um, I think in February, um, it will be a good time to talk to me. I'll let you know for sure when I get the, the results back from the, uh, from the survey we'll put out afterwards. Um, 
if our number grows, we know we were a success with the program. If the number goes down and people don't use it as much, we'll see. But I mean, it was a lot of money. Uh, we put a lot of money in a lot of rooms. I think the biggest benefit is going to be the capture. I think the majority we've already seen our classes that were split like 50, 50 students at home, students on campus that is growing more for on campus. A lot of the students that have been at home have been trouble trying to wrap their head around um, the virtual thing and, and missing out on the in-person thing, so to speak. So uh, we've noticed that a lot of the classes have either gone full remote or they're starting to migrate slowly back. Um, the, the hybrid portion of it, the web virtual portion of it, I think is um, this semester will be, it, it'll hold its own right now, but I think it's gonna go one way or the other. Um, once the uh, spring semester gets here, provided that, you know, they had good success using it and they feel comfortable with using it. And, but would they still give the students the opportunity, so. And, and will you relate that back to a pedagogical level? Like, um, you know, is their learning, is their results going, getting better? Is, it, is, is the outcomes going up from a, from a learning level? Yeah, um, good question. We're four weeks in, so we're going to do a student survey and we're going to do uh, an instructor survey. So I can't answer that yet to see did was it positive or, or was it not positive? Did did the it results grow? Yeah, it's definitely something. I just had a meeting at 10 o'clock this morning with with our team, our Rebel Flex team, and we're developing a, a survey right now. So there's like 25 questions on the survey that are going to go to students and the instructors. And we're trying to mirror the surveys that so they're very, very similar, but they're tailored to each other. So we know that this question and this question match up. So if our answers kind of jive going all the way down. So hopefully we'll, we'll uh, be ready to get those those um, surveys sent out in a week or so. And then by the end of the semester, we'll send another one. And then we'll uh, go over all the data and, and see, what, see what we did. Yeah, right. The Rebel Assist, mm -hmm. Assistant, which is the person sort of driving this from within the space, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Will that be a permanent fixture? Yeah, we have enough money to do it for one more semester. Um, I think we're going to try and develop a way that we don't need to have the assistant in there. However, like I said earlier, we've spoiled our instructors here before. We put a lectern in there that's full top to bottom with every piece of tech they need mm. to stick a student in the room now. I don't know. It's, it's kind of above my pay grade. Um, it's, it's, I could tell you it's very hard to fill that many positions. Um, I mean, we pay the student workers pretty well for being, a, uh, to sit in a room for an hour and run a classroom, but I think, um, I think we'll have enough maybe to do one semester. I don't know what's going to happen after that. That's why we're calling this a pilot. So we let this pilot run out and we, we see what happens from there. Yeah. Nice one. Nice one. And, and I, I mean, first of all, I think, uh, using the word rebel is, is, is very apt because you're, you're a bit of a rebel yourself, Frank. Um, I see your <laughs> comments on, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm not one to shy away from pissing exactly. people off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But what, what, about, what about your other spaces? Like what I'd like to know is um, how does it work at your university, at UNLV? Uh, we, when we spoke with Joe, he said that the faculties uh, have their own budgets and quite often yep. they'll put in their own technology that are not supported by Joe and his team. Is mm -hmm. it the same with you guys? And I know that you guys also have multiple campuses. How does it work between faculties, campuses, all those kinds of things as far as standardization? Because I think there's a real benefit in standardization where you're rolling out the same uh, familiar technologies and products and also the support at the back end and, and, and buying power. And buying yeah. power as well. How, how does it work at UNLV? Yeah, uh, you're 100 percent right. That's it's kind of what when I was saying before about we're changing our our name from from uh, classroom technologies to campus technologies because yeah. I have 190 general purpose classrooms, mm -hmm. but I have about 180 departmental classrooms. So that's you know 370 classrooms uh, across campus that standardization helps because so the departments get their funding however they get their funding. And when I say departments, business college, criminal justice, uh, urban affairs, they all get their independent money. I have a budget for general purpose classrooms only, but they still come to us in our department. We help them with their design of their classrooms. We facilitate the installation. 
Um, sometimes we program it for them. Sometimes we just uh, share our program with the programmers from the integrator and they dump it onto them for them. So they still have the same look of our rooms, even though they're paid for by them. So essentially it's fiscally responsible, goes to the department. The financial stuff is all handled. There. Anything breaks, they got to pay for it. But we will help them um, get it designed, installed. If there's construction that needs to get involved, we take care of all that. We make sure that our network people are involved. So all of our networking matches. So essentially it's, it's my right arm is my general purpose classrooms. My left arm is my, is the departmental classrooms. We have the same amount of availability of, of resources to help them. Occasionally we'll get folks that'll call us and say, Oh, I went to Best Buy. I bought a display. I want to hang in my room. Like <laughs> you're on your own. We won't, yeah. we won't do that. And, yeah. and that's where we, I would say if you have to draw a line, that's where we do it. So for instance, now our medical school over at Shadow Lane, our other campus, they're building a building right now, five-story, big, huge building, brand new medical school for us. Uh, we just graduated our first med school class this year. They've been working out of an interim space that we designed for them, installed, maintained for the last three, four years. And now they're building their own building. And they are, um, actually I'm working pretty closely with the integrator of choice, the consultants and our team is working with them to make sure it is part of our standards because essentially in five years, the university is going to own that right now it's paid for by a private consortium is, is, is funding the building um, with a little bit of state money. But in five years, I believe the deal is that this be, the building 100% becomes UNLVs. So at that point, it's going to be my headache anyway. So I said, you know, let me, let me work with the folks over there. They already work well with us. They know what we want. They know how we can support each other. If something goes down, I got a, box, a closet full of boxes that I can run one over and, and hot swap something if the integrator can't get there fast enough and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, so buying power wise, we get to, it, it's good because we have stockpile of, of extra equipment and then I can, you know, put it where I need to put it when, when stuff fails for the departments and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, um, that's the draw. That's the bottom line. Is financially, it's them. Support, yeah. it's still us. Gotcha. And and, yeah. and you you mentioned networking just then, and and also you said that you rolled out uh, Crestron NVX in the Dolby Atmos theater. Mm -hmm. Is that the university's standard? Are, are you rolling out um, NVX or AV over IP solutions in these classrooms, or is it a bit of a hybrid model? What are, what are yeah. you doing there? We're rolling it out where it's needed. Um, right now, we're we're still. Um, we're, we're still in the belief of it's, it's not required everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. We're very happy with our, our latest design. And, and frankly, the Rebel Flex design uh, is, a, is a huge departure from our traditional classrooms. We, we kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater and completely started over. Um, when it comes to NVX, for instance, the, the two largest deployments we currently have are in both auditoriums. And the reason why we're using them in the auditoriums is because the lectern is all the way down there and the control room is all the way back there. And I got to send yeah. all that stuff. So let's send it all over network, right? It's the easiest way yeah. to do it. So from, from those aspects, we use it. I have it here in my control room in my office. We have a video wall in here that we use and we have NVX running all that. So we do use NVX. It's just, we don't use it in our general purpose classrooms right now. Um, it's just, it, we're not there yet. I mean, the product might be there, but we're, we're not there yet. We're still very when happy with, not, with the way we have it. When, when you say we're not there yet, are you, are you referring to more uh, your team or are you referring to your network? Because obviously, you know, like yes. if you're putting the, all these devices on the network, you got to make sure it's pretty robust to be able to handle all this, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, the, you know, the, the Crestron magic word, 10 gig. Um, yeah. terrifies a network person. You're like, I'm right. going to be, you're going to be sending traffic both ways. I'm like, we're not going to be sending that much. It's just the way yeah, they yeah. say it. Yeah. So yeah, there, there is a little bit of that, um, a little bit of, I wouldn't call it fear, but it's a little of that pushback. Um, you know, th it's kind of like that old saying NIMBY, not in my backyard. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's like not on my network. And yeah. you know, since uh, this rebel flex project came, we we've gotten really tight with our network guys. Um, mm -hmm. Got a good relationship going. Now they're realizing that, it's all not bullets that are firing across that network. Like, like we care about that stuff too. We don't want to send all that traffic on that network. We don't want to crash your network. So we got a good relationship with them now. We've, we've got them configuring our switches for us. They configure our ports for us. Um, and we're working really good together as a team. So I think when we are ready to start deploying NVX on a massive level, 
um, mm-hmm. we'll be we'll be ready for it. But I, I just don't think right now was a good time to do it. Um, we were have a lot of network projects going on right now. The the fellas are uh, they're changing out IDF closets everywhere. They're they're going through all the old equipment. They're changing out WAPs every place. They're adding WAPs all outdoors. So those guys are completely overloaded right now at work, just like we are. So we didn't think right now is a good time to deploy it, but it gives us more time to test and play on our end. And then when we're ready to go, we'll, we'll be ready as a team. And are you using the network for audio at all? Like say Dante or ABB? Yeah. yeah. So all of the ceiling mics that we have in our Rebel Flex room are all, all over Dante. So yeah, we, we have, um, uh, we use a biamp uh, to Sarah Forte with the Dante in it. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's, that's what we're doing. We've been using Dante for, for a while. Okay. Do you use that on the on a separate network? Do you keep your, a lot of that stuff separately, or do you? It's always integrated into the IT infrastructure. That's a good question, um, and that is why I'm not a network person. I don't know. <laughs> to, to be honest with you, I don't know how they have it uh, segregated. To be honest, I don't think they do. I think um, they they activate the ports. They get my my configurations onto their security standards and how they want it. But other than that, I don't. I think it's all running on our data VLAN. What have you got going on, like moving forward? I mean, you guys, more than most. I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't, I've been to your campus. I haven't been to Joe's campus. Uh, I have been to other universities in the US. I, to be honest, I wasn't overly impressed with other universities. You guys really stood out when when I I went and, and did that tour five years ago. Um, I know from the work that we've done in Australia, the, the standard is very, very high in Australia as far as AV goes or technology goes. They like to push the boundaries. I know you like to push the boundaries. Where, what, what, what's your roadmap? Like where are you heading? Obviously, you've, you've dipped your toe in the water with, with NVX and you, you're doing Dante, so you're using the network. Well, what's, what are you, are you got anything in, uh, in the pipeline? Are you testing other new technologies? So what, what, what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, right now we're going to roll out more Rebel Flex rooms, and and that's that's our biggest priority right now is to get the the campus a little bit more flexible for for virtual learning. Um, we have our new med school building that I spoke of earlier, so that 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 puppy is getting ready to go up. It's already they're already pouring concrete onto the fifth floor, and they're they're putting up studs. So that that building's probably going to be done within the year, um, and and I'm sure our team is going to be over there quite a bit once they cut the ribbon to support them just just to get their feet wet and to make sure that they're they're up and running because even if they hire a whole bunch of uh, student workers or techs it's going to be all new for them so Mm -hmm. we'll have some aspect of helping in that Um, but I'd say right now I mean outside of our rebel flex right now uh, we have some buildings on campus that we're renovating that that weren't ours they were owned they were leased to other um, areas, uh, I think the EPA and some other government agencies rented some buildings from us and we're getting them back now. So they're older and they're gutting them. They're doing asbestos abatement and we're putting in some classrooms and some offices and some learning spaces like that. So right now, I mean, we're kind of focused in on renovating existing stuff. We're building the med school and we have, you know, the Rebel Flex pro- project going on. We have a couple other small projects that are here and there. Um, uh, but um, I I can't quite say what some of them are just yet. Come uh, on, Frank. I mean, these, your secret is safe <laughs> with us. I mean, you've got to you you got to one up Joe. You got to you got to put him in his place. Come on. That's that's tough because, I mean, Joe was given the it was like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. He opened up that <laughs> that 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 bar and he got the golden ticket to do what he wanted. Yeah. He looks like a genius, that guy because. <laughs> They gave him all that money pre-COVID and he came out with yeah. this idea and he's sitting yeah. back. He's like, yeah, look what I did. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So he, he, he's got me for now. I'll, I'll let him have this one. Okay. But uh, we're, we're, um, we are rebuilding our fusion server at the moment. We are now fusionless and we are building a brand new robust server and our fusion deployment, same as our programmer, same guy. He's got some things up his sleeve to do some wild things with Fusion. So I think um, you, you'll, you'll probably be hearing something from that in, in a little while once we get that up and running again. We're going to tie in uh, Fusion, and, and we use Sennheiser's cockpit to maintain mm-hmm. all of our microphones across campus. And we have, I think we have like 150 or 160 different Sennheiser devices across campus. So we're going to tie that into there for monitoring as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's more right now as a, as a maintain and upgrade 
and uh, just keep our eye on the prize and we'll see what comes down the pipe. Interesting. I'm interested to know as you continuously uh, talk deployment, uh, for us over here in Australia, um, supply is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Is, is, is the same thing happening over there? I'm assuming it is. We're not. We're not just. Yeah. Everything's just getting kept in the states, and nothing's coming over Australia, are we? Is, is, is yeah. That... No. We. We. Um. So we got lucky. We ordered our Rebel Flex gear back in April, uh, and we fulfilled the whole order um, by June when we were starting to roll it out, except for uh, half of the eight by eight switchers that we use. Um, so yeah. Those are still were someplace being built, and we'll get them eventually. But we have a workaround, and we're gonna we're gonna try and uh, get the rooms working without that. But we had everything for our project. So it was like two million dollars worth of gear, and we had everything but you know twenty of one device. So uh, other than that, all these other projects that I have going on, these smaller projects, um, there's like one thing here and there that's missing, and it's like six week lead time, ten week lead time, fourteen, two month. All right stop giving me a lead time. Like I, I get it. Anyway. <laughs> right. How about you don't give me a lead time and it just shows up and I'm happy. Like, cause I mean, if, if you give me a six month lead time and in two months it shows up on my doorstep, you look like a genius. But if you give me a six week lead time and then okay. tell me at, on the fifth week, it's now 10 weeks. And on the ninth week, it's now three months. You look like an idiot, not a genius. Because yeah. yeah. at this point, you don't have your own supply chain in check. Yeah. So stop trying to sell me. Stop trying to, to, to send me things because you can't ship it to me. If you can't ship it, I don't want to hear it. And, yeah. and I know Joe is talking about the same thing. Yeah. So you've got that flexibility, I suppose, in your design that you can, you can wait. Um, yeah. You, you don't see... A uh, question for both of you, actually. Do, do you see uh, any changing of the guard for some of the really strong products that are out there that can't supply? I, I think, honestly, I think we're going to be into this for another six, eight months, maybe, mm. maybe longer. Um, it's going to take a while to come back from this chip shortage. It's just not technology. It's everything. Yeah. I mean, okay. some, fo some, some companies can't get glass for touch panels and monitors. Mm. There's a stamped steel shortage from, I mean, Legrand was having issues with stamped steel. Um, there's flat panels, uh, capacitive touch things. It's not just a chip. I mean, there, there's, there was a shortage, geez, there was a shortage for uh, rubber at one point mm -hmm. and, and cable prices went through the roof and then it came back down. So, you know, who knows what's going to cause the next backlog? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. I just saw a thing this morning. There's like 60 boats off the coast of California waiting to get into LA Harbor and, and they can't get in because there's an employment shortage on the dock. So it's not only tech. It's, it grows every, every way you look at it. There's, there's other issues. Exponential uh, effect, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. So will we see opportunities for others, Pete, you reckon? Some, some of the people that are, yeah, some look, of the small companies I, coming through that go, I've got, I've got it. I've got the product. Look, we saw that in Australia back in um, Ooh, let me think, roughly around 2010, 2011. And that was when HD Base T first came out. And I remember back then AMX pretty much owned the university market in Australia. And they, they, done a, they did a great job um, getting their product in there, getting their solutions in there. And then HD, HD Base T came around. And Crestron had been doing uh, digital media, you know, prior to using the HD Base T or the valence chip mm -hmm. and so they were better set up to when they started using the valence chip to, to roll that solution out they had a similar solution already but amx struggled they it was their first generation of, of uh product over twisted pair and they really struggled and then what happened is obviously a lot of universities sort of threw their hands up in the air so this is not working we need to look at another solution so what I, the reason why I say that is I'm comparing that time to where we are right now. You know, there was a problem, something wasn't working right, and it forced it forced these universities to look elsewhere. Crestron were like, hey, I've got a product that works, and mm -hmm. they were able to pick up That's a nice lot products. of universities. And, yeah. and, and now you would say that the majority of universities in Australia are, are Crestron universities. So I see a similar thing. I think I know that when we talk to Crestron, they, they're like, 
hey, you try to give us some heads up. There is obviously some uh, shortages going on. Um, we haven't experienced that to date, like we have, like on, on our projects, thank God. Um, but I do see that company or projects will be forced to use maybe a competitor's product because yeah. it, it's just not available. And then that creates opportunity as well, right? So I, I see it as being an exciting time because a lot of people get kind of stuck in their ways on a particular brand and product. So it might open the door for some of the, the smaller players mm -hmm. that have come through. I mean, we did the same thing when we heard there was a shortage. We were like, Oh, well, this box does this. Well, let's go look at that one. So we yeah. get one in and then next thing you know, uh, it doesn't do exactly what we wanted to yeah. do, but it's close. So, you know, you, you kind of, sometimes you make some concessions and you say, well, I can use mm -hmm. that box. Right. So, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Every box that's in that lectern is a dumb device. We have to tell it what to do. It mm -hmm. doesn't do anything. This out of the box, I love that phrase because, oh, it works out of the box. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. So that, that, that theory that it works out of, but no, it needs to be programmed or configured. Any way you yeah. look at it, mm -hmm. something needs to go in there and tell that thing what to do. And, yeah. and I, I, I've challenged every engineer I possibly could from every company to tell me otherwise. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, we, we, we all know this, um, a lot of the, the bigger the company, the bigger the marketing team, Frank. And, mm -hmm. uh, We've seen all sorts of things that have been said over the years to try and win business. And I think, I think the people who are in the industry, you know, we just want to know the facts, right? Yeah. We just, just, just be straight down the line with us. Don't try to, you know, sort of come out with all this, you know, marketing spin or anything like that. We're not interested in that. Just be down the line. Tell us what it does. Tell us what it doesn't do. And we'll make our mind up whether it goes into a, mm -hmm. you know, into one of your rooms or into a project or not. It, it's one of the reasons how like I met you at Infocom was yeah. like we as end users in higher ed, I think we are, I think the AV industry is afraid of us. Mm -hmm. And I think they are because we're smart and we know what we want and yeah. we do the research because mm -hmm. if you look at Infocom show floor, it is packed with higher ed people and all yeah. the training classes packed with higher ed people because higher ed we sell education here. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we do in higher ed. So yeah. my boss and everybody above us are like, what are you doing to further your, you know, your education? So we're constantly taking classes. We're constantly getting certifications and that's something that, you know, they instill into us and we instill into each other here at other universities. And we know as much or more than many uh, consulting firms, many integrators, mm -hmm. Uh, and frankly, many manufacturers, we found many problems in products that we have talked to engineers. The next thing you know, there's a firmware update because it was found on our campus or another university's campus. So I think for the most part, I think, I think higher ed end users are feared by the rest mm -hmm. of the AV industry because we know what we want and we're darn good at it. So I think the reason why Infocom needs to happen, like I hope right now, like knock on wood the other day, they they said it's still going to happen, but it needs to happen because we still need to go out there and talk to people and we still need to see our peers. And that's, you know, something about um, from an education standpoint, I think uh, it's something that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and just like you, you mentioned before about uh, your students sort of missing out by not having that in-person um, education like they, they once had, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously everyone learns differently for me. I, I would always want to have that in-person education. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I agree. I think, uh, you know, events like Infocom are needed, you know, and especially we've had this gap since I think the, the last show in our industry was ISC 2020. 2020. So be, yeah. Um, so it's going to be 18 months since the last show. So I think it's important obviously numbers exhibitors are, are going to be down. That's, that's fine. That's fine. We need to make it happen. We need to get back on our feet. We need to meet in person. We need to, to, you know, to have that human experience again. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I know that you're going to be there, Frank. Yep. All right. And yep. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to catching up with you uh, over there because, you know, it's, 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 these shows are they've been missing for too long and no fault of infocom i think you know they've tried they yeah. tried to push the date back and you know they it's a, it's a juggling act right now and i i just i'm really looking forward to the show yeah it, it, i think it's going to be fine i think um it, 
to be honest, I think it's going to be better from an aspect that is going to be a lot less pressure. There's going to be a lot less of the, of the sale because right now I think they understand there's a shortage just like everything else. And I think they just want feedback right now. I think they want feedback and they want honest feedback. And I think there's gonna be a lot less people. So you're gonna be able to get around the booth a little bit more. Dinner reservations won't be a pain, pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think uh, traffic won't be as bad on, on international yep. drive there. So, yep. hey, you know what? I'll, I'll take a, a, a watered down version of Infocom any day of the week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly got to start some way, don't you? Yeah. Sure. Oh, I would love to join you over there, but, you know, I'm not allowed out. <laughs> not allowed out. Yeah, yeah still right. got that big fence around you guys. Yeah, we have. Yeah, might as well have a wall. You're allowed in, but you're not allowed out. Yeah, right? I know. Go figure. Yeah. Work that one out. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, Frank, it's been an awesome, uh, awesome t- uh, time to spend with you, mate, and uh, pick your brains and um, get an understanding around you, around what you got going on at uh, UNLV. Um, thank you so much. We need to. Yeah, we thank, do need to thank wrap you up. for having me. That it was awesome. I mean, uh, uh, if you guys ever need somebody to, to come up here and stand on a soapbox and scream and yell about something, Pete knows how to find me. Exactly. <laughs> we we need to get him back on the show. We need to get him back on the show next year, right? Once he's delivered these secret yeah. squirrel rooms, these top <laughs> secret rooms, we yeah. need to find out all about it. And see see how they turned out and uh, what the, what the reaction was like because we need more people in the in the industry like Frank people who are passionate yeah. and yeah. honest yeah. give like you give honest feedback um, you know that's that's what this industry needs knowledgeable passionate honest people yeah. and that's Thank that's what Frank is. Pete. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It can't always just be Pete who's. Uh, uh, telling telling the suppliers with brutal honesty uh, <laughs> what needs what to happen. <laughs> don't, a, don't ask my opinion if you don't want an answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's try, give it to them straight. <laughs> well done, Frank. Thanks for joining us, uh, and we look forward to talking to you all soon. Have a, good. Uh, a, a great time. Talk to you soon. See you, Pete. See you, mate. Bye. Cheers.